All right. Uh, good morning. Uh, I think we're ready to get started. Uh, so my name is uh, Titus Kurek. I'm a product manager at Canonical, uh, mostly focused on OpenStack, but also helping with other parts of the data center business at Canonical. And uh, in this session, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, cloud optimization, and, uh, cloud optimization techniques. So uh, just to set the stage for this conversation, um, this is how the inflation forecast for 2023 is going to look like globally, uh, according to like the, the latest estimations. Like after the two difficult uh, pandemic years, you know, uh, uh, a lot of you know geopolitical uh, mess happening in 2022. Uh, the inflation has increased globally, uh, putting a lot of pressure on organizations and also you know the IT departments. Uh, because uh, if you think about that, you know, like all of that translates into increasing costs. It's not just the cost of the cost of life that's increasing, but it's also like the cost of energy that's increasing. That's the cost of the. Uh, data center rental, that's increasing. Uh, that's the uh, uh, operations staff salary, that's increasing. It's everything, right? So uh, obviously, a lot of that puts um, a lot of a pressure um, for um, uh, various types of uh, organizations. Uh, and, uh, you know, like it puts them in a very uncomfortable situation when it comes to 2024 budget planning uh, for IT departments, right? So, um, uh, if you if you think about that, uh, the average spendings on cloud infrastructure uh, actually constitute a very significant portion of organizations' budget. Uh, you might not be aware of that, but uh, according to Gartner, like 41% uh, of the uh, IT budget is spent on cloud infrastructure. Right? That's a lot. Right? Like that. That's basically almost half half of the budget. Right? Of a typical of a, of a typical organization, right? Uh, and uh, when we when we take a look on that uh, from like an organization-wise point of view, uh, that's almost six percent of the capital budget, right? So every organization, whether this is like a research institution, whether this is like a, a, a government, or whether it's a telco, whether it's a, a software company, whether it's an enterprise, whether it's a manufacturing uh, company, uh, on average, on average. The spendings on cloud infrastructure constitute to the six percent of the capital budget. So that's a lot, right? Uh, and obviously, like, why am I saying that? Uh, because uh, if we manage to lower the TCO uh, associated, associated with uh, cloud infrastructure uh, maintenance, uh, that can result like a significant uh, savings for organizations of any type, and uh, you know uh, can can basically help to mitigate the negative impact of the inflation, uh, which, which is visible through, you know, like an increase of uh, data center rental services, you know, like electricity cost, and so on. Uh, so uh, what, what I'm going to be presenting uh, in my uh, session uh, will be some kind of uh, cloud optimization techniques that everyone can apply from public clouds through adopting the hybrid multi-cloud architecture uh, down to a non-prem infrastructure, uh, so the private cloud, like uh, your own clouds. Uh, and one point that uh, I, I uh, forgot to highlight is that this is a sponsored session. Uh, so as a spotlight sponsor of the uh, event, Canonical gets uh, like one sponsored session. So you're going to see some Canonical products uh, being featured here, so don't get surprised, even though uh, it's still going to be more uh, tech-oriented. Um, so uh, we're going to talk about cloud optimization, but let, let's, let's define what it is first, right? So what, what is cloud optimization? It's basically allocating right resources to cloud workloads and data, right? If you think about that, uh, whenever you are running an application, whenever you are storing the data in a cloud, like you need to decide where is it going to be hosted, where is it going to be stored. Uh, would that be one of the public clouds? Would that be um, a specific uh, type of a storage, like in public clouds? Uh, and uh, this might be this might be your own cloud. This might be a cloud that's run by the managed service provider. Uh, you might use uh, some you know expensive resources uh, to to power your applications. You might use more uh, cost-effective resources, right? So uh, 
it's, it's, all about the, it's all about making a decision at the end of the day, right? And uh, cloud optimization is all about allocating right resources to cloud workloads and data. Um, in, this, uh, in this process, there are a couple of inputs that uh, everyone needs to take into account. So uh, first of all, uh, compliance, right? Like, uh, am, I, am I obligated, like, am I obligated to store my data locally, for example, right? Or can I store my data in a public cloud, right? Like, if I put, if I might, if I put my data, like, in this particular cloud, like, will I, will I still be compliant, right? Like, there might, there might be some internal policies that the organizations adopt. There might be some policies that are enforced externally. Um, so uh, first of all, like whatever you do, wherever you run your applications, wherever you store your data, uh, those might need to be compliant with some regulations, either internal or external. Uh, second of all, performance, right? So um, you, might, you, might, uh, you might choose depending on you know, the type of a workload, uh, whether it's going to be put on some you know, uh, highly performant uh, substrate uh, and, and you know, utilizing you know, like more RAM or vCPUs underneath. Or uh, if this is not like a production workload, maybe, maybe you know, like you're oversubscribing, right? Like you shouldn't be using so much resources to power this particular application, right? Because uh, at the end of the day, you know, like every resource being consumed translates into the cost on the uh, IT department side, right? Uh, and uh, finally, functionality, right? So uh, will I have all the desired functionality if I run my workload, like in this particular cloud, uh, on this particular type of a VM, uh, compared to, uh, well, running an on-prem, for example, right? Uh, so those are the three kind of inputs that always need to be taken into account when trying to come up with an optimal decision for the workload placement and for the data placement, right? So compliance, performance, and functionalities, right? Uh, what you get as an output from the process is a total cost of ownership, right? Like how much is it going to cost me to run a particular workload in this particular place to host this particular chunk of data in this particular place, right? Um, and um, so now, you know, like uh, uh, basically by applying uh, various types of cloud optimization techniques, we can influence the TCO, right? And uh, if we do it in a smart way, that all results in a TCO reduction, right? So we can actually reduce the total cost of ownership associated with uh, cloud infrastructure. And uh, this can help to, you know, to lower the budget, uh, well, to not to lower the budget, but uh, to to meet the budget, right? But this can help us to meet the budget uh, with, you know, like less cost, less spendings uh, on cloud infrastructure, leaving way more space for, you know, like uh, uh, hiring additional team member uh, or 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 investing in innovation, for example, right? So. Um, in the following uh, three sections, I'm going to talk about the exact techniques that can be, a cloud, uh, that can be uh, applied across uh, various types of clouds. So starting with uh, public clouds. Uh, first of all, like there are some uh, general considerations that uh, you should be taking uh, into account when running uh, you know, your workloads in public clouds. So first of all, uh, choose the right region because the prices change significantly depending on the region. Uh, Maybe, you know, if it's not like a production workload and does not need to have like a super high bandwidth, uh, maybe it could be running in some region where the prices are lower compared to other regions. Uh, be smart and use pricing calculators to estimate costs uh, so that you would not be surprised like at the end of the month or at the end of the year with the bill that you get from your uh, public cloud provider. Uh, Group resources that have the same life cycle, uh, so that you know, like, uh, if if they are shut down for the night, for example, like uh, they, they don't run 24 per seven, uh, then you know, like you don't forget cleaning up unused resources. Uh, consider containerization of the workload of your workloads, uh, just to you know uh, make sure that you're using the, the least amount of resources as possible, and uh, finally adopt 
infrastructure as code techniques to automate everything. Uh, one uh, particular feature that's uh, very compelling when using public cloud services and is adopted by all the leading uh, public cloud providers are kind of reserved instances, right? So even an organization commits to a certain usage of cloud resources over time. Let's say uh, they, they know they're going to consume like this amount of CPUs, that amount of RAM, that amount of storage throughout three years, for example, then they can uh, opt in for uh, significant uh, 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 discounts. Uh, that can leave uh, from 30% up to 70% uh, cost savings, uh, according to our research. Uh, Another type uh, of instances uh, that's uh, provided by the leading public cloud providers are spot instances. Spot instances basically use uh, spare capacity uh, of public cloud. So if there's like, there are some nodes that are underutilized, uh, public cloud providers uh, can offer spot instances that would be utilizing those uh, resources. Uh, the only drawback is that this is not suitable for production because uh, if those resources need to be allocated to some other types of low workloads, uh, then those workloads would get terminated or stopped or hibernated depending on the specified behavior. Uh, but this is something that could be used for development purposes, for example, right? Like if a workload can be interrupted, maybe spot instances are the option. So uh, based on our research, this can lead up to 91% cost savings, so like compared to the list prices, uh, so that, that, can, that can result like in significant cost savings. Uh, one other thing you can consider is using uh, ARM instances. Uh, if your application is uh, suitable for running on ARM, if it supports uh, ARM architecture underneath, uh, you can put your workloads on ARM instances. Those are usually available at a lower price compared to like AMD and Intel uh, um, architectures while uh, providing uh, the same level of performance. So it's basically like a better price performance ratio. Implement policies when running your applications uh, on public clouds so that, uh, you know, for example, if uh, you're using public cloud resources for development purposes, uh, if you're Developers are working in an office and they're going back home for a night, right? Like, uh, and they should be cleaning up resources on public cloud, not to leave any instances running there to create like an additional extra cost, unnecessary cost. You can implement policies to, for example, you know, shut down uh, all of your workloads running in a public cloud at a given time to make sure that that those are you know either shut down or, or completely cleaned up. So uh, those were like kind of a general techniques that can be adopted uh, in a public cloud space. Uh, now moving to the uh, hybrid multi-cloud uh, architecture. Uh, just, to, just to start with some data. So um, according to the uh, Global Hybrid Cloud Trends Report from Cisco from 2022, uh, hybrid cloud is basically gaining momentum these days, like something that 82% of IT decision makers have already adopted, right? So uh, this is becoming a kind of a trend. Uh, so what we're going to see uh, in the future is that you know everyone is uh, consuming some resources from public clouds, but at the same time they run their own uh, cloud infrastructure uh, for various reasons. Uh, cost optimization is one of one of those. Um, and uh, what what's really more. Uh, representing the reality of today is, is a multi-cloud architecture. So basically consuming services from various uh, cloud providers at the same time uh, can be multiple public cloud providers, can be multiple private cloud providers, can be a mix of those. And uh, here, according to the uh, report from 451 Research Group, 48% uh, of IT decision makers have repatriated their workload. So what does it mean? Like uh, if, if, if you know what the repatriation trend is all about, it's like a lot of companies initially embraced public cloud offering because it was like super easy to consume, but then over time they realized, you know, like they, their, their costs keep growing because uh, public clouds come with a relatively high uh, OPEX cost over time, right? So there is a trend that's happening these days. It's like a lot of companies are actually considering 
a repatriation of their workloads back from public cloud infrastructure to an on-prem. Um, and just to briefly give you an overview how those costs usually shape so uh, across public clouds and private clouds. Uh, so uh, if we start with a capex, so like the initial investment that organizations need to take, uh, with public clouds, uh, it's, it's usually like almost zero, right? Because the infrastructure is just there. Like all you need to do is to attach your credit card and then you can start consuming the resources. While the private cloud usually comes with a relatively high capex cost, like you need to purchase the hardware, you need to uh, deploy uh, the cloud uh, on, on top of this hardware and so on. But uh, the trick is that over time, you know, that the, the, the OPEX cost associated with a public cloud is relatively high, while on a private cloud side, it remains relatively flat, right? Because assuming the fixed capacity, uh, regardless of how many workloads are running on your private cloud, it's, it's still like the same cost. It's the same electricity, hardware maintenance cost, and so on. So this is how it looks like when we add the two. So we get like the total cost of ownership, so CapEx plus OPEX over time. Um, and now uh, if, we try to, if we try to kind of represent that on a single picture, there's obviously like uh, a period of time where public cloud would be preferred from the uh, TCO point of view, because it's just cheaper, right? Especially on a small scale, when using it in a short term, uh, public cloud is definitely a preferred option. But uh, at some point, at some point, like those two uh, curves cross, and this is where it's more optimal to use hybrid multi-cloud architecture from a cost optimization point of view. So uh, just to give you, just to give you a feeling of how it can look like, uh, we've, we've, we've got three scenarios represented here. Uh, those are from uh, Canonical's uh, cloud pricing report that we issued in uh, 2022. Uh, so starting with a very simple scenario, like a small scale, uh, uh, small scale application deployment, uh, an internal CRM system that you've got like some resource requirements documented here in terms of the number of vCPUs, amount of RAM, amount of storage, and so on. So this is how those costs shape, depending on whether the workload is placed on a public cloud or in a private cloud, right? So it's, it's pretty much evident so that at a small scale, there's no economical justification for running this kind of a small uh, uh, you know, application deployment in a private cloud. It's just, you know, like it's, it's not, it does make sense. However, when you take into account like some more advanced scenarios, so it's like a, a medium scale deployment and online banking system, right, uh, with uh, way more resources that are required to power uh, this, this kind of a workload, uh, it, it becomes evident so that, you know, like um, over time, over time, it basically makes more sense to place it in a private cloud. Just because, you know, like the, the OPEX cost, again, associated with consuming so many resources from a public cloud provider uh, uh, becomes higher compared to like the TCO of uh, setting up and operating a private cloud over time. And like a uh, third, third scenario, like a large scale, uh, large scale workload, a video streaming system, uh, something similar to, to Netflix, for example. Uh, this is how it could look like. So, uh, you know, in this kind of a scenario, you know, like there, there's need for data warehouses, data lakes, you know, like uh, this data needs to be stored somewhere. Uh, there's need for data analytics, you know, a video transconding engine, web application, providing an interface to the end user, like it's, it's, it's let's, let's assume it's operating, you know, millions of users, right? So uh, there, there is a need for way more resources uh, that are available for this kind of work. And on that scale, it becomes even more evident so that from an econ economical point of view, it makes more sense to set up your own uh, cloud infrastructure for powering this kind of an application, right? Uh, so what I wanted to demonstrate here is that uh, it is always, like before we go to the uh, cost optimization in private clouds, uh, it's, um, it's always important to make data-driven decisions, right? Uh, depending on the scale, depending on for how long uh, the exact workloads are going to be run. Uh, it, may more, it may make more sense to run it in a public cloud or in a private cloud or use both, right? Like use both in the hybrid multi-cloud architecture. Whereas, you know, 
Some workloads uh, might be running where it makes more sense from the economical standpoint while still using like highly scalable uh, public cloud resources during the uh, heavy load periods or, for, or, or to provide the, the functionality that's not available uh, in a non-prem infrastructure, right? Like, for example, having a private cloud for powering the production workloads while, you know, like if, if some development needs to happen on ARM, let's say, and uh, if there's no ARM servers on-prem, those could be run in a public cloud, right? So be smart and use the best of the two worlds uh, and, and make data-driven decisions. And uh, finally, when it comes to cost optimization in private clouds, like this is how uh, a typical budget uh, for private cloud can be represented. So uh, it, it consists of like four pilars. Uh, there's some hardware and facilities costs uh, associated with setting up the cloud on-prem, uh, software licenses and services for uh, basically uh, setting up the uh, cloud software on top of the hardware. Uh, our analysis show that the most of the TCO associated with private cloud infrastructure is spent on internal operations and maintenance. Uh, so, you know, uh, uh, data center maintenance, you know, staff salary and so on. Uh, and only like a very small portion of the budget is usually allocated to R&D and change, which is like the only positive cost uh, on, the, on the organization side as it enables them to uh, explore new technologies, grow, be more competitive on the market and so on. So uh, a couple of tricks that can be used when setting up uh, your own cloud on-prem. So uh, first of all, use optimal architecture for uh, private cloud implementation. Uh, and what we usually promote as, as a company is that uh, Use, use the one that provides the best price performance, right? So uh, th th this, is how the, this is how the curve, the cloud performance, the cloud price uh, usually looks like. So, uh, you know, like you can, you can continue adding, you, you can build a cloud using, you know, that the, the most expensive components that are available on the planet, but there's always going to be some bottleneck at some point that will unlock you from using all the benefits of the underlying hardware. Uh, this, can be, this can be limitations in software, this can be limitations in, in OpenStack, in Ceph, in Kubernetes, right? Uh, so be, be smart, right? And, and, and use an optimal architecture that does not put an extra pressure on the budget while still providing the desired level of performance. Uh, use right software distribution model, uh, something that does not put you in lock-in, something that's open source uh, also enables uh, flexibility um, and, and modularity uh, so that you would be able to integrate the cloud platform that you're using with uh, other open source components that are required to power your uh, business applications. Uh, automate and package cloud operations. So uh, in, in Canonical's world, like this is mass and Juju, right? So mass takes care of uh, metal automation while Juju takes care of uh, applications automation, basically. Uh, and uh, shut down unused machines. This is really important, right? So uh, there are, uh, there are in, uh, it, it is not uncommon to see, you know, unbalanced uh, clusters uh, when running on-prem. Uh, so there's like a service in OpenStack that's called Watcher that basically enables you to uh, automatically live migrate instances between nodes and uh, shut down uh, nodes that, that, that are not necessarily powered up at that point. Um, and uh, one final thing, uh, consider whether you should go with a fully managed service or whether you want to operate the cloud yourself. Again. Depending on the scale, you might be surprised so that uh, on a small scale, it's actually more economical to rely on fully managed services provided by the managed service provider rather than setting up your own operations team from the ground, training them, upskilling them. Uh, it might actually be more cost effective to rely on the managed service provider. Of course, at some point, it makes more sense to do it yourself, right? Uh, it makes more sense, like from the resiliency point of view, from the uh, avoiding you know, any kind of a vendor dependency point of view, it may, more, it may make more sense 
to hire a dedicated operations team for your on-prem infrastructure, but on a small scale, from the cost point of view, it actually makes sense to rely on the fully managed services. So um, that's, uh, that's what we, uh, so uh, by applying all of those uh, techniques uh, on the private cloud side, like uh, th th this, can, this can lead to uh, decreased TCO uh, of the private cloud infrastructure, which uh, at the end of the day, results like increased innovation because like the, the, the portion of the budget that's now safe can be spent on, on innovation. Um, so uh, one thing I wanted to highlight uh, is that we had, uh, we had another session yesterday about, uh, about uh, Kate's native uh, OpenStack. Uh, there's a new project, Sunbeam, uh, that uh, has landed in the OpenStack tree uh, as of yesterday. So if this is something that you wanted to try out, you can scan this QR code, follow the tutorial that we put together for you. Uh, at the end of the uh, tutorial, you'll get an activation key that will enable you to collect an exclusive merge from Canonical at the booth. So uh, don't be shy, try it out. Uh, we can even give you a virtual machine to try it if you don't have resources on your workstation to do it. Um, and that's, uh, well, I can go back uh, if you need to scan it. Uh, but that's, that's mostly it uh, in terms of the uh, content for this presentation. So I believe we have five minutes for potential questions. Well, if there are no questions, then thank you very much for your attention and uh, happy to chat at the booth uh, if you have time to visit it. Thank you. Thank you.